put our hands together this morning for Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our strength, our, our high tower, our refuge, our fortress. In him I put my trust, our salvation, our King of kings, our Lord of lords, the great I am, my Redeemer, my Savior, my Deliverer. Woo! Come on, give it up for the Lord Jesus today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wake up your neighbor real quick. Say, wake up, neighbor. What are you excited about today? I know we got a Super Bowl later. Any Rams fans out there? Let me see. Give it up for all the Rams fans who came. They put God first before the Rams. That's commendable. Come on, do better than that. Help them out a little bit. The Rams are going to need a lot of prayer today. Now, you know if you're a Rams fan, coming to church is not going to help, right? <laughs> Praying for the Rams is probably not going to help. But we're glad you're here. Amen? Amen? Give your neighbor a high five and tell him I'm glad to see you. God bless you. You look so, so nice today. You look churchy. Praise the Lord. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, we're here to celebrate the Lord Jesus. So you being here early this morning tells me that you're hungry for God. How many are hungry for God? You're here this morning because you want more of God in your life. Amen? And that you are a type of person that puts God first in your life. Can I say, is that true? Amen. Nobody here was forced to come, right? You're here on your own accord. I want Jesus. I want to put him first. I want to come early. I want to seek him in the morning time. You're doing what the psalmist said. I'm seeking God right when the dawn is breaking. Amen? And so we're here to hear from the Lord, and, and God has given me a tremendous word for you. I spent all last night wrestling with the word in and God simply wants me to share this with you today. And if you could just write this down, it would be perfect. That you are chosen by God. You're chosen by God. And if, if there's anything I want you to leave here with today, is that simple fact that you accept it and receive it. That God has chosen you to be a vessel for him. And it doesn't matter what your resume is. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what you've done, even last night. Because the fact is that God is calling you. And the Bible says that no one comes to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws him. And so you're not even here by your own accord. You're here because the Holy Spirit drew you in to the house of God. And so why don't you give a round of applause for everyone who obeyed the Holy Spirit this morning and allowed him to draw them in to God's house. And so you're here under the canopy of God's presence. And in his presence, there's not only fullness of joy and life everlasting, there's also the selection process for God. God is canvassing the area and he's speaking to every single individual in here in his own way and kind of moving them toward their next step. What is your next step? Your next step as a father, as a mother, as a minister of God, as a husband, as a wife, as a mom, as a dad. God is choosing you to be a champion for your family and to, to be able to use you for this generation and for your life. I met a man the other day who said that he's been running for God for about 40 years. He's been called by God and chosen by God to do certain type of ministry. And, and he just feels like he's missed that mark. And now that he's older, it's become more pressing upon him. And so I told him it's not too late. You're going to start today, as a matter of fact. Moses was an old guy when he got started, so don't let, don't let your age uh, stop you or don't let your age trip you because God doesn't, he's not concerned about how old you are. All the old people should have said amen right there, 55 and older. Amen. We're here in God's presence. You guys feel God's presence today? 
And Pastor Marco has declared a vision from God this year that God's presence will be made manifest everywhere. We're going to reach 60 or knock on 60,000 homes in San Bernardino this year, 2022. We've already started the first initiative. We've reached over 5,000 homes all in one day, not including all the other homes we reached throughout the week. So we're well on a way to making this vision come to pass. Very, very simple. On Feb February 19th, say February 19th, which is this Saturday at 9 a.m., we're going to have the opportunity to be used by God in our community where we're going to go throughout the streets of San Bernardino and we're going to knock on doors. And I did the math. If a 1,000 of us go out, all we have to do is knock on five doors to, to reach 5,000. That's quite simple, don't you think? We can even do more than that in one day if a 1,000 people show up. So how many people are going to show up next, this Saturday, the 19th? Let me see your hands real quick. Praise the Lord. God bless you. We'll be looking for you. Amen. You just, the camera just took a picture of you, so we know, we know who you are. Amen. You might say that God's presence, Pastor Joe, is already here. His presence is omnipresent. Why, why does he need or require human presence uh, to do his work? Well, the fact is that God always wants a body to inhabit. He wants an embodiment of his holy presence. He wants to use your body as a vessel for him. And if we don't allow our bodies to be used by God, then the devil will use our bodies for other things. And so either we allow our bodies to be used by God and be a source of his divine presence, or we allow the devil or the flesh to use our bodies for, the, for his work. How many want to be used by God? So God always desired a body to work through. That is why he came in the embodiment of Jesus Christ. He needed a human body because he gave the earth to human beings. So he needs human beings to do the work of God here on the earth, which is why he put himself in a body and came as Jesus Christ. And then when he left, Jesus said, I'm going to leave you the same spirit that I have. I'm going to leave it for you, my disciples, and the same Holy Spirit that dwelt in me now dwells in you. And the disciples were able to go about and do the works of Jesus just like he did because of the presence of God in their lives. And now the apostles are gone and guess who's left? You and me. You and me. There's no difference between what they had and what you have today. The work of God and the work of the Holy Spirit is still going on today. And it's going to continue to go on until Jesus returns again. And so the idea is that you come into a room like this and you receive assignments from God. He chose you. He needs you. He wants you. He desires you. And you might be scratching your head saying, why? Why? Doesn't he know what I've done? Of course he knows what you've done. You have been chosen by God. Say that with me. I have been chosen by God. Don't say you because then you're pointing at me. No, not me. I'm talking about you. I have been chosen by God. Tell your neighbor that. Tell your other neighbor that. I've been chosen by God. When I was in elementary school, way back when, we used to have recess. And at recess, it was the most fun time. We had recess and we would play sports during recess. And a favorite sport that I would like to play would be, of course, football. And we played uh, flag football during recess. And I remember that it was really, really fun. It was more fun when we, when we would win, but it was always fun just to get out of the classroom and do something extracurricular. And, and I remember that I used to love to be the captain. You know, they choose a little captain. Who wants to be the captain of this team, captain of this team? I, I, me, me, me. Choose me. And so I would be the captain of one team, and they would have to go through the class, and you get to pick your team, right? There was one kid that nobody wanted to pick. His name was Alan. 
Alan was kind of slow because it was kind of robust. And uh, nobody wanted to pick Alan ever. Uh, girls would get picked before Alan got picked. He was always the last one to get picked. But during the course of time, I felt like I wanted Alan on my team. And for some reason, at one recess, I saw Alan and I picked Alan first. I chose Alan. And I chose Alan not only to be on my team, but to be my best friend. And I believe that that was the right thing to do because I found out that Alan can block. Alan, he was a good blocker, and nobody knew that. And so Alan began to block for me, and we were scoring touchdowns all because of Alan. And I remember Alan says, get on. And I said, what do you mean get on? Get on my back. And I got on his back and with the ball, and he, he ran toward me, blasted through everybody that was on the field, and we scored a touchdown. And Alan soon became my best friend. And nobody picked on him no more. Nobody looked down on him nor. They found value in him because somebody chose him. They saw that we, he can do once he was put on the field. Amen? So some of you in this room, you have no idea the potential that you have because you, you're disqualifying yourself based on your past or, or your record. When God says, I want to put you in, I chose you for this work, and you're going to do a great job for God. I believe at that time that God was revealing his heart to me, even as a young boy, that God chooses the least likely of persons if you're to line up all the people on that football team I believe that Jesus would have chose Alan first because we have a tendency to choose for our advantage we choose based on how it advantages us but that's not how God chooses God chooses the disadvantaged we, we respond to the best. We want the best. But God responds to the worst. So it's not about how good you are. In fact, it may be how bad you are that you're a great, great candidate to be chosen by God. And so what I want you to do is get into your spirit that everything that's gone wrong in your past does not matter. All your weaknesses do not matter. Your sinful life does not matter. When God chooses, he chooses against the grain. God loves a mismatch. He loves an underdog. He has this deep desire for the disadvantaged. He's attracted to my weakness. God is. God's attracted to my hurt. He's attracted to my opposition. God is drawn to your catastrophe. You understand? The fact that you have a need is what draws God to you. So when no one else chooses you, God chooses you. Amen? Tell your neighbor, God chose me. Say it with some confidence now. God chose. I don't think you understand, neighbor. God chose me. Mm -hmm. I think that some people that God put in the Bible are there to make us feel good about our walk with God. Like there are some people in the Bible that you could be, have a terrible walk with God and just be, you know, not do, be doing good at all. And then all of a sudden you read about a person in the Bible and all of a sudden you, you start to feel a little good about yourself. Man, because this guy, he was a joker, and, and I'm doing much better than that guy. And it kind of puts a little pep in your faith. And so God not only put people who were successful in the Bible, he put people in there that were complete failures. 
so that we can see that it doesn't matter what the failure is. It doesn't matter what the disadvantage is. It doesn't matter what the obstacles are. Those things don't affect God's choice. And so we're going to read about one of those persons here this morning. Can we do that this morning? Let's, let's be encouraged by this person's life. You're going to leave here encouraged. Amen? And you ought to be glad because Pastor Joe usually brings a whip. But the Lord gave me an encouraging message. So you're going to be very encouraged when you leave here today. Amen? So let's look at Exodus chapter 3. In beginning in verse 15, the Bible says this, God said to Moses, say to the people, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, say Abraham, the God of Isaac, say Isaac, and the God of Jacob, say Jacob, has sent me to you. This is the first time in the Bible that God references himself in this way. That he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He'll continue to do that throughout the scriptures, but this is the first time that he does that. And if you note that the people that he references are a little bit unique to one another. Abraham, the name Abraham means this. The father of many nations. Anyone here named Abraham? Raise your hand if your name's Abraham. Nobody, huh? All right. Sergio. How about Sergio? No, I'm just kidding. Abraham. God said, I'm the God of Abraham. I am the God of the father of many nations. That's awesome, huh? And then he said this, I'm also the God of Isaac. The name Isaac means one who brings laughter and joy. I am the God of Isaac, the one who brings laughter and joy. And then he says this, and I am the God of Jacob. Jacob's name means fraud. It means swindler. It means deceiver. The name Jacob means hustler. If we can put it in today's terms, con man. And so a name like that makes me question why God would associate his name with Jacob. Moses, I understand, or Abraham, I understand, Isaac, I understand, but Jacob, I don't understand why God would use his name to reference himself. Because if you're, if you're a student of the Bible, you will know that Jacob is a little messed up. He's one of those guys that's so messed up, he makes us seem normal. We look like spiritual giants in the faith compared to his life and how he lived his life. He's messed up. In verse 30, or or chapter 32 of Genesis, we're going to read about Jacob's kind of like his introduction so that we can learn from him and and just the kind of person that he was. And you're going to, we're all going to find out that he was, he was a really bad dude, but Even though he was so bad, God still chose him. And that's the point we're trying to drive home. That it doesn't matter how bad a person you are. That God still chooses you. So get all the excuses out of the way. Don't make excuse why you can't follow God. Why God can't choose you. Because the worse off you are, the more that he's calling you. The more that he's choosing you. And so in verse 22, the Bible says this. And Jacob arose that night and took his two wives. See right there? That's crazy. Just that right there. 
he arose at night. Everyone knows you don't wake your wife up at night, number one. And number two, you ain't ought to have two wives. That's bad. I dare one of your husbands to ask your wife, you know, hey, hey, I'm thinking about introducing a third person. What do you think, honey? I think the Lord's kind of leading me here. Ain't happening. He has two wives, and guess what? They're sisters. Imagine having two wives and they're both sisters. That would be really bad. But that is his life. And then the Bible says this. Look at this. And then he has two female servants. Why not some male servants? He wants to be around women. And he likes them in pairs, obviously. Two female servants and then his, watch this, 11 sons. I thought you, you thought you had a lot of kids. Ele- your kids don't disqualify you either. One golf clap in the second row, praise the Lord. And he took his 11 sons, his two wives, his two female servants, He wakes them up at night, and he tells them to go across the river Jabbok. You see how crazy that is? Who does that? Who wakes up their family at night and sends them across the river walking? That's super dangerous. That's super wrong. That's not rightful thinking, right? And so this guy's nuts. Look in verse 24. It says, afterwards, after his family, they listened to him and they crossed over the river. Afterwards, Jacob was left alone. And a man, or what we call a theophany. In other words, it was God or Jesus made manifest. A man came, God came, Jesus came. And wrestled with Jacob. And he wrestled with them until the dawn. So he sends his family away at night. And then Jesus comes at, at once to a cross. And he wrestles with him all night long until the morning. Now when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, the Bible says that he struck the socket of Jacob's hip. And he struck it so hard that the hip joint came out. And the man said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So the man said to him, what is your name? And he said, my name is, listen to this, Jacob. My name is fraud. My name is deceiver. My name is hustler. My name is con man. God knew the interpretation of his name. He knew what kind of person he was. And yet he asked him, what is your name? Verse 28, and then the man, God said, your name shall no longer be Jacob. For you shall be called Israel. Your name was Jacob. But I've come to choose you. And when I choose you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change your name. And that's what God did. He changed his name and he said, your name is no longer Jacob. Your name shall be called Israel. And the name Israel means one who prevails as God prevails. That's amazing. In that one moment, God changed his name to prevailer. And God was telling them, Jacob, Israel, kings and kingdoms are going to come from you. 
Priests and priesthoods are going to come from your loins. Warriors and world changers will all come from you. And even my son is going to come through your lineage. I'm about to rewrite your whole life in one moment, Jacob. In one meeting with God. That's why you never miss church. Because one meeting with God can alter the course of your life forever. How many of you came to be changed by God? I knew I was in the right place. When God chooses Jacob, it makes no sense to Jacob. Because Jacob knows Jacob. So when God chooses you, it doesn't make sense to you. Because you know you. And you know the things that you do. And you know the things that you think. And because you do these things or think these things, somehow you feel disqualified. But you don't get to qualify anybody into God's kingdom. God is the one who qualifies you. It doesn't matter what you do or what you think. God is choosing you. And if he chooses you, he will change you. He will do it. You can't do it. God can do it. You make the choice and God makes the change. You can't do it without God, but God won't do it without you. So God's choosing you, yes, but you must choose him. So Jacob is saying, how in the world is this happening? He knows who he is. I'm a complete fraud. I'm a deceiver. I'm a con man. I'm a fugitive. When we find him by the river with his family, he's on the run. He's running as a fugitive. He's running from his older brother Esau because he stole Esau's inheritance and his blessing. And Esau has vowed to kill his brother Jacob. And Esau is coming to Jacob with an army of 400 men. And he's going to chase down Jacob and kill him. And so Jacob is nervous. He's scared about facing his, his brother, his future. But God intervenes. Jacob is thinking about his brother He's worried that his brother's going to catch up to him and kill him. But Jacob has a much bigger problem than Esau. Because not only is his brother Esau chasing him, God is chasing him. And it's one thing for people to chase you. Or it's one thing for the devil to chase you. Or it's one thing for uh, um, the cops to chase you. But it's completely different when God is chasing you. Because if God is chasing you, and I know he is, you cannot outrun God. It's impossible to outrun the Holy Ghost. You can go to the highest mountain, and he's there. You can go to the bottom of the sea, and he is there. You can make your bed in hell, and he is there. There is no place that you can go to possibly hide from his presence. If God is chasing you, just give up. Just surrender and say, I'm here, God. I accept your call. I accept your mantle. I accept the responsibility. I accept the change. And just give up. Because I know this. God will chase you. And he will find you. And there is no place that you can possibly hide. You know how come I know? Because I've tried it. And you've tried it. And some of you are giggling right now because you, you know this is truth. That God won't let you get away. You could run from God and go to the nightclub. 
and be cutting it out on the floor. And God will show up right there in the nightclub and say things like, what are you doing out here? Or why are you dancing like that for the devil? But you didn't dance like that for me in my house. And then you go to the nightclub. Oh, I got to go, guys. What's wrong? I just got to go. You could be in the bar. Don't matter to God. He'll show up right there. He will show up in that bar. Right there in the bar. You're trying to get drunk and you can't get drunk. Because God is like a, he's like a buzz killer. And the only thing he's allowing you to get drunk on is to get drunk on the Holy Ghost. That's the only thing he's allowing you to get drunk on. Tell your neighbor, stop running from God. Not only has God caught Jacob, he caught him. But check this out. He also begins to wrestle with Jacob. <laughs> Have you ever had to wrestle with God? Are you wrestling with him right now? You're trying to go one direction, but he's trying to submit you into his direction. And so Jacob is wrestling with Jesus. And when we refuse to change or we refuse to give in, God will come and wrestle your will from us. He will wrestle your will away. He will break you down. And he will not stop. He will chase you. He will catch you. In the darkest of places, he will catch you. Where was Jacob? It was nighttime. Trying to hide in the night. Doesn't work. God found him. And God began to wrestle him in the night. And when Jacob wouldn't give up, because he's so stubborn, he wouldn't give up his will. God says, I'm going to have to break something. And he struck his hip bone. And his socket, his hip bone came out of place. And so sometimes you might be a person or I've known a person or maybe it was you that God chased you for years and years and years and wrestled you for years and years and his grace and his mercy was there. Come on, child. Come on, son. Come on, daughter. But when you didn't listen, God put the breaking on you. Crippled you. Something went terribly bad. Completely broken by God. I would have to imagine that everyone in this room has, has, knows what that feels like. Because most of the time when, we, when people come to salvation, they come what? Broken. Broken. I've never seen someone you know, come up to tell, oh, I feel like just getting saved today. Why are you getting saved? I don't know. It just feels good. Probably, it never happens. People usually come just broken, crying, you know, their life's a mess. But that's not the first time that God has called them. God has been calling Jacob for years, and he's been calling you for years, and saying through your, through your parents or through loved ones, and say, you're different. You can't hang out with those people. I raise you different. You've been hand-selected by God. We prophesied over you. We put oil and anointed you, son, daughter. You're different. But when we're stubborn, God will break us. Have you ever been broken by God? How many broke? I just want to know right now. How many are broken right now? Praise the Lord. You're in the right place. You're in the place of surrender. The only reason that God is breaking Jacob 
And the only reason that he will break us is because he wants to bless them. He wants to bless them. He wants to change his name. He wants to change his destiny. He wants to change his purpose. But Jacob keeps fighting the change. The Bible says to submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee. You must submit to God. Stop running. Stop wrestling. And just submit. Give in. But Jacob doesn't want to give in. He keeps fighting with God. So God says, I must break Jacob in order to change his name. I'm going to have to cripple him. And so God breaks him physically. Sometimes when God breaks us, it's physical. Something physical happens in our body. Something hurts. But God is breaking him physically so that he could save him spiritually. You understand? God hurt him so that he could save him. And salvation is more important to God than a busted hip. Glory to Jesus. Some of us are still have that broken thing. And you carry it to this day. And it's a reminder that you wrestle with God and that he won. But you're here, and you're following him, and you're serving him. And people ask you, how'd you get that busted hip? Well, I got a story for you, pal. <laughs> That's okay. The very things that hurt you are the very things that brought you to God. You understand? When we look for people on the streets to minister to, I don't know about you, but I look for broken people. Messed up people. The worse the, the, worse, the better. Because they are prime candidates for God. They're hurting. They're hopeless. They have needs. They're great candidates for God. And God is choosing them. You know, I, I drive to the downtown campus almost every day. Even driving in here this morning, I see people on the side of the road. And sometimes I'll, I'll, just, I'll just shout, God is choosing you. God chose you. You don't have to live like that. You don't have to beg and suffer. God is choosing you. God loves you. When I see people that like that, I don't look at their current condition as where they're at. I look at where they can be and should be. When I see a homeless guy, I don't see a homeless guy. I see a guy with a testimony. I see a guy with a story. I see a guy with a bad name, a bad rap. I see potential. I see him as my friend, Alan. Nobody wants him, but I want him. I want him. We want those types of people in our church. We want those people, inner city, broken people. We want them in our church. And so that's why we're going out and hitting the streets. Because they're out there. The Jacobs are out there. And if we don't go out and tell them that they're worthy of God's selection, they'll never hear. 
Because all of us in this room were once Jacob's, or maybe still are. You look good now, though. You're, you're Israel now. Look at you all nice. Looking all holy. You're Israel now, but you were once a Jacob. You were once in bondage. You were once a pawn of Satan. But Jesus redeemed you. Jesus chose you. And Jesus changed you. And so he took your hurt and he healed you. So rather than you be upset about your hurt, rather than us be angry about who hurt us in life and who did what, we're at the point where we're thanking every person that ever hurt me. I had to make a phone call. Thank you for hurting me because had you not hurt me, I would not have ran to Jesus. That's what the call is. You should not be calling people and getting mad at them for hurting you. You should say, thank you so much for breaking my heart. I appreciate you so much for that dagger you put in my heart. Thank you for cheating on me. Oh, God bless you. Thank you so much for cheating on me. I really appreciate it. Because that cheating led me to Christ. That cheating brought me to Jesus. That cheating uh, it allowed me to be selected by God. Amen? I'm looking at my time. Let's stand to our feet. You guys are so quiet. Look at how quiet it is. The Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I know it's quiet. God is speaking to you. He's choosing you. Your confidence is building. You're being built up, edified, encouraged. That you have been chosen. He says, I am the God of of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God of the con man. I am the God of the fugitives. I am the God of the prostitutes, the adulterers. He put that there so you and I can know that we don't have to be perfect to be chosen. That all your imperfections I would draw him to you. Jesus was drawn to imperfection. He was drawn to people that could not be healed by anybody. He loved those type of people. And so the best candidate for God are people that are broken and their life is a mess. And if that's you here today, your life, you want a better life. I want you to know today that God has, God has sent me here to tell you. And you got to make the choice. But he's choosing you. He's choosing you. And he's choosing you. He's choosing you. He knows about the affair. He knows about the two wives. <laughs> he knows about the two female servants. He knows about the 11 children. He knows everything. But it still doesn't disqualify you. He loves you. And has chosen you today. And so all over this room, if you're ready to accept the fact that God is choosing you, and you're ready to surrender, stop running 
and stop fighting and wrestling with God. If you're ready to do that, God, I'm ready to surrender to you and your will for my life. I want you to just make your way forward right now so we can acknowledge you, pray for you, and most importantly, cheer for you. Get excited for all these folks coming up. Come on, get out of your seats. Come forward. Just surrender to the Holy Spirit. Just surrender to the Holy Spirit. Surrender. Surrender your will over to God. Come on, just surrender. Say, God, I, I surrender to you. No more running. No more breaking. I, I'm giving up. I surrender to you. Amen. Yeah, come on, celebrate. Good job. Come on, church, let's get, you're going to clap for the Rams later louder than that. Come on, you got to celebrate right now what God is doing in these lives. Uh, I'm excited for what God's doing right here. bow our head, close our eyes. I still feel there's maybe a few more Jacobs out there. Just make your way forward. There's a couple ladies. Come forward. Come on, we're going to wait on you. We're going to wait on you. like to maybe pray for this young man right here. Right here in the white shirt. You stand out. Is that your wife? Hold their hand. Lift your hands to the Lord. You guys stand out. You guys are you've been called by God. Chosen by God. And everything that you've been through has pre-selected you for the choosing. And all the hurt, all the pain, it's all going to make sense. Because God is not only going to heal that pain and change your lives, but your testimony is going to draw others to God too. And so if you just hang on, stay together, don't give up. Stay together, don't give up. Stay together. Don't give up. No matter what comes, he's going to see you through. He's going to see you through. Okay? You guys are awesome. Awesome, awesome. Stretch your hands out to these folks here. If you're next to them. Father, your will be done concerning their life. Touch them, Father. Draw them to their next level. Open their eyes to see the big picture, the vision for their life. Let them know, Father, that they've been chosen, Father. Heal all the old wounds, all the suffering, all the things that the devil tried to do, Father. We put a stop to those assignments over their life right now. In the name of Jesus, we break the backs of the enemy. And we pray that Jesus, our Redeemer, our Savior, our Lord would canopy this marriage and begin to shape them from this day forward. In the name of Jesus, we bless you, God. Amen, amen, amen. If you came to the altar, just stretch your hands out real high. So proud of you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I love this. Thank you, Lord. Repeat with me. Say, Jesus, I surrender to you. 
I give up my will for your will. I know that you chose me to be yours. Use me however you see fit. I surrender my life to you. Take my sins from me. Heal me. Change me into the person you want me to be. I surrender right now. I release all the condemnation, all the guilt, the past. I release it right now to you, God. Take it from me and give me peace. And I also pray for those closest to me that you would save them and bring them in. I thank you, Jesus, for my salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead, lay hands on her right here. Go ahead, lay hands on her. Right on her head. The Holy Spirit's all over this young lady. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We thank you. Let's give one more round of applause for all these folks who came forward. The altar team is going to minister to them. If you need prayer for anything, please come forward. You have an amazing day. We love you. And we will see you when? Saturday at the downtown campus. God bless you.